Let me just lay out what I believe is happening here. Mm. Has he ever told you about his friend Frank? Frank? Yes, the giant bunny rabbit. Donnie is experiencing what is commonly called a daylight hallucination. <laughs> Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film and Comics Explained. Let's be honest, on first viewing, Donnie Darko is a baffling experience and one that confuses just as much as it delights. Supported by strong performances from Jake and Maggie Gyllenhaal, Noah Wilde, Drew Barrymore, Mary McDonnell, and the late Patrick Swayze, Richard Kelly's batshit crazy and incredibly cerebral directorial debut is a stunning piece of cinema that is impossible to fully understand without time to process its highly unusual structure and plot. No film other than the equally confusing synecdoche New York has wormed its way into my head quite like Donnie Darko, and I've often found myself thinking about its confusing aspects and themes. While I might not be a physics or philosophy professor, with the help of my overstimulated brain, multiple viewings of the film, heavy dosages of caffeine, discussions from 16th century philosophers, and clips of Neil deGrasse Tyson explaining the universe to me, I'm going to do my best to explore the meaning and philosophy of Donnie Darko in this two-part video. So what exactly is Donnie Darko about? That's not an easy question to answer, but let's break the story before we dissect it further. On the surface, Donnie Darko is a story about a wide-eyed, naive and neurotic high school teenager called Donnie, who struggles to fit in with his surroundings. But beneath that is a complex discussion on free will, determinism, and the quest to understand our existential purpose. We meet Donnie on October the 2nd, 1988, in the small town of Middlesex, as he wakes up on a road in the woods after sleepwalking. From the start, it becomes apparent that Donnie is troubled and often nowhere to be found. This prompts his family and friends to constantly ask, Where do you go at night? Even when he's home, Donnie is unresponsive to his parents, Rose and Eddie, and disregards their pleas for him to open up. And he's also playfully abrasive and offensive to both his siblings, prompting his older sister Elizabeth, played by Jake's actual sister Maggie, to reveal that he'd stopped taking his medication. As his detachment and frustration at not knowing his purpose in life begins to increase, an entity from a tangent universe known as Frank suddenly appears and says, 28 days, 6 hours, 42 minutes, 12 seconds. That is when the world will end. When Donnie wakes up the next morning on his local golf course, he returns home to find that his sleepwalking had saved him from a plane's jet engine, which mysteriously crashed through his bedroom in the middle of the night. Bizarrely, not a single person can determine where the engine came from, and after forcing his family to sign non-disclosure agreements, investigators put them up in a hotel and promise to repair their home. Over the next few days, Donnie continues to see Frank and exhibit strange behaviours, prompting a psychiatrist to begin hypnotherapy and wrongfully conclude that he was suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. During this period, Donnie befriends new girl Gretchen, who's moved to town with her mother to escape her violent stepfather. The pair bond, finding solace in their shared feelings of alienation, and Gretchen becomes one of the primary factors, causing him to eventually accept his purpose in life. After being prompted by Frank, Donnie asks his science teacher, Kenneth Monatif, if he believed in time travel. Monatif then encouragingly gives him a book called The Philosophy of Time Travel, and it's here that the pieces to the puzzle begin to fall into place. This book is the most important key to understanding Donnie Darko. Written by Roberta Sparrow in 1944, when she taught science at Donnie's school, the literature serves as a bible for the film's characters and helps them navigate the story. We glimpse pages from the philosophy of time travel, and its contents are discussed by the characters in the film. It's only when we read the excerpts that the concepts within reveal their importance to the film. One of the most important ideas of the book is the two dimensions of the film's story, which it refers to as the primary universe and the tangent universe. The primary universe is essentially the universe that Donnie usually lives in, whereas the tangent universe is a copy that forms due to a glitch in the fourth dimension of time that happens just prior to the jet engine crashing into Donnie's house. We never find out what caused this glitch, but what we do know for sure is that when Donnie is sleepwalking, he's actually travelling into this tangent universe. Which is why the correct answer to the question, where is Donnie, is that, depending on the time of day, he's either here or in the tangent universe. Later, after Frank has convinced him to set fire to the home of a motivational speaker with a dark secret, Donnie holds a Halloween party to celebrate his sister's acceptance into Harvard. 
seeing more signs that indicated Frank's prophesized end of the world might be real. Donnie and Gretchen head to Roberta's home to unearth more information to see if there was a way to undo everything. Unfortunately, the pair are attacked by bullies moments before Gretchen is tragically struck by a car. As the driver hops out, we realize that he's in fact this universe's version of the Frank that had been communicating with him throughout the film. Using a gun that he found in the house earlier, the distraught Donnie shoots Frank and carries Gretchen's body to his home to find a vortex forming above them. Things then go from bad to worse when he sees the plane carrying his mother and sister in the distance get sucked into the vortex, moments before one of its engines plummets down from the clouds. The previous 28 days then rewind, and Donnie awakens back on the 2nd of October, laughing as the engine falls on him. The final shots of the film are taken up by those who have been touched by Donnie in the previous timeline, some of whom haven't even met him here, including Gretchen, who rides her bike past Donnie's house and exchanges a troubled glance with his mother. In these final moments, they both share a moment of deja vu, but are unable to place where they remember each other from. I know this is going to sound kind of weird, but uh, do, you, do you know anything about uh, time travel? One of the first things we have to do to understand Donnie Darko is separate its surface story from the deeper meaning of what's going on. Yes, Donnie is mentally ill, but if you view Donnie Darko as a treaty on the delusions of a paranoid schizophrenic, then you're missing out on so much of the movie, as his visions are part of his ability to see into a parallel universe where time travel is achievable and doomsday is a distinct possibility. The philosophy of time explains that tangent universes are incredibly unstable and can form a black hole capable of destroying everything, alluding to the end of the world scenario prophesized by Frank. While he doesn't discover this till later, Donnie has in essence been chosen by an unknown higher power to play out the role of the living receiver, whose mission it is to return the artifact, the thing that can prevent the end of the world, to the primary universe in order to restore order. The book states that the living receiver is given fourth dimensional powers, including telekinesis, the ability to travel to alternate universes, enhanced strength, and mind control. But these come with a cost in the form of the hallucinations that manifest as symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia and the inevitable sacrifice that Donnie has to pay. The movie shows us the aftermath of Donnie using these abilities. We learn that he destroyed the plumbing in his school and had stumped administration and local police by doing the impossible, driving an axe into a solid bronze statue. The artifact, as in the thing that can prevent the end of the world, is the engine that falls from the plane and crashes into Donnie's house. In the primary universe, the engine is attached to the plane and never comes free, while in the tangent universe, it falls from the plane and hits Donnie's house. It is this disparity, this creation of a copy that didn't belong, which creates the tangent universe in the first place, and only by returning the erroneous engine to the moment when it splits can disaster be averted. Here Donnie is left with a conundrum. He will save the world using his powers as a living receiver, but has no say in the matter. All he can do is accept his fate and see the beauty in his purpose to close the Tangent Universe and stop the life-destroying black hole. Of course, to get Donnie to close the Tangent Universe, a rather unusual sequence of events has to occur. Some might even say that they're too random to have any significance. But again, the philosophy of time travel explains how this happens. During the course of the film, Donnie is moved into place like a chess piece by those around him. The book calls these people the manipulated living, or dead if they're deceased. Every character he comes across pushes him closer to the goal of being in the right place at the right time to prevent the end of the world. From Sparrow, the old lady who wrote the philosophy of time travel, his science teacher Monotif who gives him the book, Gretchen who along with his family gives him a reason to sacrifice himself for the greater good, to Frank, both the dead one who guides him and the living one who kills Gretchen. Every person is a pawn in a game they don't understand and whose sole mission is to allow Donnie to accept this purpose. Who guides them all is unknown, but the subtext and later interviews with Kelly suggest that some higher being is manipulating proceedings to prevent the end of the world. When Donnie returns to the primary universe, he laughs and accepts his death, knowing that he's acted as a divine vessel of a benevolent higher power and saved literally everything in existence. The Christ and superhero metaphor is obvious here, but beneath that is a deeper exploration of the human condition and the lingering existential questions of whether we have free will or if our path has already been chosen for us. Now that we understand what happens in the film, let's tackle its philosophy. How can you do that? As mentioned in part one of this video, at the beginning of Donnie Darko, Frank provides an ominous warning that the world is coming to an end. All Donnie can do in return is ask the question why, which goes without an answer. Donnie's pursuit to understand why and what he can do about it is fundamental to this movie. 
Using his journey as the canvas, the movie tackles themes of determinism and existential purpose, while offering a rebuttal to modern society's need to reduce human experiences to simplistic and antagonistic divisions between good and evil. In spite of his incredible powers as the living receiver and his unique lens to view causally related universes, Donnie never gets control over his destiny and still never gets an answer to why the world was coming to an end. Sure, we find out that it's due to the creation of a tangent copy universe, but who created the glitch in the fourth dimension of time that led to this? And more importantly, why does it fall onto Donnie to undo this catastrophe? Unfortunately, Donnie never finds out. As we'll discuss, the reason Donnie can never understand why the world was coming to an end is because he's unable to perceive the universe around him beyond the moment he became self-aware and now. To explore this further, we have to go back to 16th century Dutch philosopher Baruch Spinoza, one of the early thinkers of the Enlightenment to tackle modern conceptions of self and the universe. His most relevant ideas to our discussion are found in his stone analogy, which sets up a scenario that reveals the illusion of free will. Conceive, I beg, that a stone while continuing in motion should be capable of thinking and knowing that it's endeavouring to continue to move as far as it can. Such a stone, being conscious merely of its own endeavour, and not at all indifferent, would believe itself to be completely free, and would think that it continued in motion solely because of its own wish. That is the human freedom which all boast that they possess, and which consists solely in the fact that men are conscious of their own desire, but are ignorant of the causes whereby that desire has been determined. Spinoza is essentially arguing that it's impossible to be totally free and understand why things happen, as we all join the world from one point in a long chain of events which already predetermine our outcome. While it's easy to assume that we possess free will by identifying ourselves as our own start and end points, Spinoza's outlook on the entirety of existence is that it's been predetermined by what came before, all the way back to the Big Bang. To apply this to Donnie, we meet him at a point where he becomes aware of the path he's on. Like Spinoza's stone tumbling down a hill, he's only aware of his observable universe, meaning everything that happens between Frank's arrival and his death, nothing more. He's incapable of understanding why he's on this path because he doesn't know what the preceding event is that caused the glitch in the fourth dimension of time. Why this is so important for Donnie is that he's trapped in between understanding and accepting this fact for most of the movie. But can Donnie still find meaning and purpose in his life, despite his inability to control his fate or understand anything outside of his predestined path? Throughout the film, he's fed a whole bunch of absolutes from different characters. Gretchen Ross cries out, I guess some people are just born with tragedy in their blood. And Roberta Sparrow whispers to him that every living creature dies alone. Rightfully, these concepts terrify Donnie at a time where he's trying to understand his place in the world. But more importantly, Donnie is never provided with hard evidence either way, resulting in a mass confusion of the divide between the actions he seemingly has control of and those he does not. In the aftermath of Donnie's bedroom being obliterated by the jet engine, his younger sister pipes up with the question, Then what happened to the plane? After all, it was only a jet engine and not an entire plane that landed on them. Elizabeth brushes it off with a They don't know, Samantha. And this moment is only truly explained in the film's conclusion. But the fact that all the characters remain eternally confused about how and why this turn of events kicked into motion enacts the realizing moment of Spinoza's stone. The moment where the stone becomes conscious and then has to make sense of its own intentions, with no understanding of the world prior to that moment. After these events, Donnie is plagued by visions of Frank, who tells him to Wake up and his waking up here is profound. As he struggles with the arguments posed by Spinoza's stone, he wakes up to the fact that these things may in fact be beyond his understanding and control. A great example of this is after Donnie and his schoolmates have been forced to watch a video from self-help guru Jim Cunningham. After laughing at the ideals in the presentation, the students are given the task of placing particular hypothetical events on a graph between fear and love, which are Jim's narrow-minded and simplistic categories of all human action. When it's Donnie's turn, he gets up and tears down the entire exercise, arguing that You can't just lump things into two categories. Things aren't that simple. She responds The lifeline is divided that way. But you're not listening to me. There are other things that need to be taken into account here, like the whole spectrum of human emotion. Of course, Donnie's made a terrific point here. He's given hypothetical events or Ling Ling find a wallet and return it to its owner, but take the money that was inside. Given a binary line between fear and love, this event is totally impossible to place, and it comes from a fundamental misunderstanding of morality and human behavior. But if we go back to Spinoza, and specifically his book Ethics, he makes it clear that there is no such thing as moral qualities to action. This again can be traced back to Spinoza's stone, because when all of our actions are predetermined, how is there any space for morality in action? 
pointing this out and challenging his teacher, Donnie seeks to solidify this understanding of the world. But as his teacher fails to appreciate Donnie's profound critical thinking and comprehension of the complexity of human beings, the poor boy is left in the dark, forced to lash out, resulting in institutional punishment rather than conceptual appraisal. Donnie even alludes to this confusion during a conversation with his therapist when she asks, Do you feel alone right now? Donnie immediately responds with, I mean, I'd like to believe I'm not, but I just... I've just never seen any proof, so I, I just don't debate it anymore. He's clearly stuck in this limbo between being able to understand that what has and will happen to him is out of his control, while also fighting against everyone else's complete denial of this fact. And of course, the response of his therapist is that further hypnotherapy is required to control his future thoughts and actions. Samantha borrows Tony's van. He gets caught without a license. Well, we're gonna make sure we don't miss that one, huh? As the film progresses and Donnie begins to dabble in thoughts of time travel, he begins to see orbs emerging from people, showing him their path of action moments before it happens. One even emerges from his own chest, which guides him to a gun hidden inside a closet, later used to kill this universe's version of Frank. This moment essentially solidifies the concept of total determinism in Donnie's mind. He takes these events to his physics teacher, posing questions about determinism and free will, but the teacher rebuts them. If we were able to see our destinies manifest themselves visually, then we would be given a choice to betray our chosen destinies. Thus, by Donnie being able to see the orbs coming from everyone, even himself, surely he's able to carve a new path and break free of this deterministic pattern. Donnie probes this further, but is met by another brick wall, with his teacher saying, I'm not going to be able to continue. Why? I could lose my job. Thus, because no solid answer can be reached, Donnie's understanding of free will and time remains without shape. Nevertheless, knowing even if he could break free of this deterministic pattern, that the result would be universal annihilation, Donnie gives himself over. If the world is coming to an end and he has the power to stop it, why it's coming to an end is irrelevant. When Donnie is met with the big questions of why events unfolded in the way that they did for him, the film posits that the answer is unattainable and insignificant, at least for him and his limited field of view. From a cosmic perspective, the events that transpired are also neither good or bad. But just because he couldn't control his fate or understand it beyond knowing what was going to happen, it didn't mean his life didn't have purpose. And in Donnie's eyes, that's something to smile about. With that having been said, that's all for today, folks. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.